This podcast may contain content that is graphic and disturbing in nature. Listener discretion is advised. She made history as America's first Hispanic woman to be appointed as a federal judge. Unfortunately, many people only became aware of her after tragedy struck her family on the evening of July 19, 2020, when a gunman opened fire. What happened that fateful night, and how did this tragedy ignite change? This is episode 39, The Esther Salas Story. Hi, Megan. Hi, Amy. Good to see you. Good to see you as always. All right. Before we get started, I want to thank one of our students for her help on this episode. Oh, okay. Yes. Shout out. Who are we shouting out to? Thank you to Alexis Orphanodikis for her help with researching this episode. Thank you, Alexis. So, Megan, today's case is interesting because I was originally going to cover Judge Salas because she's a trailblazer in the field. However, we're telling the story today not only about her accomplishments, but unfortunately, also talking about her as being a victim of a very violent crime. Well, uh, sometimes our categories overlap, right? Yeah. Usually it's victim and offender, but in this case, I guess it's trailblazer and victim. Exactly. And this happened locally right here in North Brunswick, New Jersey. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I think I knew it was that close. Do you know a lot about this case, Megan? I, I, I really only know a little bit about what we saw in you know the news. And yeah. similar to what you said in the beginning, I only knew about her because of the tragedy that mm -hmm. struck, which is a tragedy in itself that I didn't know about her ahead of time for yeah. her work. Before you tell her story today, we have a few supporters to thank. We have a few new international supporters. Oh my God, that's exciting. Isn't that exciting? Yes. So first, I want to say a big thank you to Jordan from the UK. Thank you, Jordan. And Siobhan from Australia. Oh my God, the Outback. Yay. Yes, and Siobhan's name. I love her name. It's beautiful. Sorry. You're so complimentary. <laughs> I love when you love so many different names. It's so cute. Yes, and Siobhan has a question for us, which tune in till the end of the show. You'll hear us answer those questions. Great. I also want to say a big thank you to Melissa Jimenez. Melissa, our former student? Yes. Not only is she our former student, and she was a rock star in the classroom, and I was her advisor for her honors thesis, she is killing it in the field. She really is. She's in law enforcement, and she is a total badass. She oh, really thank is. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. I'm so proud of Melissa, and I'm really so honored that she would want to support us like that. That's really sweet. Me too. All right, Megan, who else do we have to thank today? We also have Brianna Page. Thank you, Brianna, who's from Virginia Beach. That was where, awesome. by the way, I took my first vacation by myself without my parents. My girlfriends and I thought we were so cool. We thought we were going to get into like clubs and bars at 17, and we got in absolutely nowhere. We wound up sitting in the hotel room the whole time. <laughs> it was still fun. I love Virginia Beach. Anyway, um, we'd also like to thank Charlene from Oregon. Thank you, Charlene. I love your name. <laughs> I do, too. We'd like to thank Susan Cervantes. Thank you, Susan. Also from Virginia. And finally, we'd like to thank Samantha Jester from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you guys for your, all your support. We really appreciate it. Yes. We also get some really nice reviews, and these really make our day. I just want to share one, Megan, that I love. Whitney from Portland said that her and her mom listened to Women in Crime and Direct Appeal together. Isn't that so nice? I think that's the sweetest thing, and not um, the first mother and daughter duo who listen together. I think that's so sweet. Isn't that super sweet? Yeah. And we've been getting some love on Reddit lately. Oh, yeah. James was telling me. I love that. One comment that really stuck out and I really took to heart was Summer who says that we tell the story giving dignity to the victims. Oh, wow. That is really, uh, I really appreciate that. We really, we try. It's really nice when you work so hard and your work is appreciated and noticed. So thank you all so much for the love. All right. And with that, Amy, I think it's time to begin today's story. So as usual, we're going to talk about the background of Esther Salas. She was born in Los Angeles on December 29th, 1968. Her mother was a Catholic Cuban immigrant and her father was a Jewish Mexican immigrant. So her parents divorced, unfortunately, when she was around five years old. And that's when she and her mother and two of her five siblings relocated to New Jersey to live with her uncle. The family had eventually moved into their own apartment. However, when Esther was just 10 years old, a fire left her family homeless. Esther reports having to become an advocate for her family at this early age, recalling having to act as a translator for her mother, like when they had to go to the welfare office to plead the family's case. 
and some say this marked the beginning of her advocacy work. Esther's family placed a high value on education, so it was not surprising that she excelled in school. She graduated Rutgers University. So did I. Oh, I know. Yeah. She graduated in 1991 with her bachelor's degree. And then she went on to Rutgers University Law School and graduated in 1994. It was during her second year of law school when she was interning at the Essex County Prosecutor's Office that she met Mark Andrew, who was an ADA at the time, and the two would later marry. Aw. Yes. Mark had graduated college from Northeastern University and later earned his law degree at Brooklyn Law School. After working at the prosecutor's office for several years, he left to pursue criminal defense work and became a very well-known private defense attorney in Essex County. A lot of prosecutors, I think, also, they want to take that experience and they want to parlay it into making some money, too, you know? And there's more money in defense work. Private defense work. Private, (laughs) yes. Yes, Not public. In 2010, their first and only child, Daniel, was born. Daniel was described as a strong athlete who did very well in school. He went to private school, and he also wanted to go into law just like both of his parents. He had many friends and was described as a respectful boy. The family was very close, so it was very hard for them when Daniel moved to D.C. after graduating high school in 2018. In D.C. is where he attended a Catholic university. Got it, okay. After graduating law school, she worked for a private law firm and then spent about 10 years as an assistant defender in federal court. During this time, she had served for about two years as the president of the New Jersey Hispanic Bar Association. Right. She was in the federal system. Okay. Yeah. The New Jersey Hispanic Bar Association is an organization made up of law professionals, those who have interest in issues that affect Hispanic communities, particularly the legal community. So she was very involved in the community. In 2016, she was elected from a group of just 99 applicants as a U.S. magistrate judge for the District of New Jersey becoming the first Latina in that position. That's very cool. Yep, and this would not be the only time she makes history. One of her biggest accomplishments would come in 2011 when President Barack Obama nominated her for federal judgeship and she was approved for the position, making her the first Hispanic woman to become a federal district judge. That is so cool. I'm sorry, when was that? 2000? 2011. Did you ask because you're surprised that it took so long for there to be the first Latina woman? I think so, yeah. I was like, geez. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Esther was involved in a lot more. You're going to love this. She co-developed a program called the Pre-Trial Opportunity Program, which was founded on the premise that many substance abusers are arrested for behaviors that are related to their drug and alcohol addictions, and but for those addictions, they would have lived law-abiding lives. This is very similar to drug court. However, it's offered at the pre-trial stage and acts as an alternative to prison. So they don't get the stigma of going to prison and having that on their record. That's so smart. It's really great. I mean, other states, we've seen this um, in other states, but this was the first program of its kind in New Jersey. And it's very important, specifically on the federal level, because most federal drug-related crimes carry longer and harsher prison sentences. That's so true. I'm always, um, well, I'm a big fan, not always, but I like pretrial diver- diversion programs. Absolutely. And it's also commendable because it involves judges in the rehabilitative process, while also increasing public safety and lowering the jail population and prison population, which, of course, is cost-saving as well. Agreed on all counts. Yep. And this program has been studied. It has been shown to reduce recidivism. It does this through the support networks and the personal attention people receive. And it also teaches coping skills and accountability. I mean, that's just sim- similar to drug courts. And yep. they, they show pretty high success as well for the cooperative and rehabilitative nature of them. Yep. So that makes sense. Judge Salas is doing all these wonderful things. And she's also presiding over several high-profile cases. For one, do you know what case she presided over in 2014? I mean, I don't have a clue. (laughs) Do you know Teresa and Giuseppe Giudice? Uh, From The Housewives? Yep. Whether you know this or not, if you are a Housewives fan, they were brought up on charges of bankruptcy, fraud, and tax evasion. The two were convicted and sentenced to prison by Judge Salas. Do you know who represented Joe Giudice? Joe Tacopina? No, <laughs> which that, that would be, a, but our friend John Satanic. Oh. Yeah, he's one. I know he was a lawyer for him in this. That's so interesting. And for our listeners, who's John Satanic? He was our lawyer consultant on direct appeal with the Mellon yes. McGuire case. Very cool. Small world in, in Jersey, it really yeah, is. absolutely. Something interesting I want to point out about this trial, Salas had actually considered giving the couple probation and gave them the chance, which was something she had done in previous cases. She was always looking to help people out. However, Teresa and Giuseppe had withheld information from the court, and they did not disclose everything they were supposed to. I think this was items such as a list of their assets and other financial information. So due to their withholding of information and failure to complete 
a financial report and such, Salah said, all right, you're going to prison. So she actually had given them a chance to avoid prison time, but she viewed Teresa's actions as being, quote, a lack of respect to the law and therefore sentenced them to consecutive prison sentences. Good for her. I was going to say that. I feel like that's really appropriate. It was really cool of her to offer them an opportunity and really silly for them to squander it. Yep. And I respect the fact that she offered it and they screwed it up and she took it back. Yeah, me too. In 2018, Salas issued an order temporarily blocking ICE from deporting certain Indonesian Christians in New Jersey. Now, these individuals were present without authorization in the U.S., and they were subject to orders of removal. They were seeking legal status. The order dealt with about 50 people who had pled persecution in Indonesia and had lived in New Jersey for many years before they were being targeted by immigration enforcement actions. Also in 2018, Salas sentenced Farad Roland. He was a leader of the Newark South Side Cartel. It's a set of the Blood Street Gang. Uh, I've never heard of that sect, to be honest. Yeah. So he, she sentenced Roland to 45 years in prison for his role in a series of crimes that range from early 2000s to 2010. Mm-hmm. And this included five fatal shootings, a carjacking, and drug dealing. What I find the most interesting about her role in Roland's case is earlier she had ruled that Roland's intellectual disability made him ineligible to be sentenced to death under the Eighth Amendment. The Eighth Amendment prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. So this just illustrates again how she's always on the right side of justice. She seems fair, I guess you would Very say. Very fair. You know, it's hard to say right and wrong, but yeah. she seems to be fair. She seems to have a concern about justice, but mm-hmm. also, you know, humanity and, and rehabilitation and, yeah. and whatnot. I definitely like her approach so far. Yep. Around the time of the incident that we're discussing today, Judge Salas had just been appointed to preside over the high profile case involving the pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. Oh, you're kidding me. Nope. I did not know that. So it involved Jeffrey Epstein kind of in an indirect way. So it was really about Deutsche Bank. This case involved New York regulators who were seeking to fine Deutsche Bank for ignoring red flags concerning Epstein's transactions at their bank. The case really focused on the disregard for the fact that Epstein was a high-risk client. So they turned a blind eye with it when they should have been scrutinizing. Exactly. Like way more so. So the reason I bring this up is this case is still pending. This is important because it inspired some crazy conspiracy theories because oh, okay. immediately... People said, oh, Judge Salas, she's presiding over this case that involves Epstein. And there's all these conspiracy theories about Epstein to begin with. And well, they probably thought it because he's the most high profile. And, you know, I'm sure they assumed right away that it had to do with him. Absolutely. I get it. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know that the police did, but the public for sure did. As you can see, Judge Salas was very accomplished. But as a federal judge, she had plenty of people who wished her ill. So let's turn to the tragedy now. Okay. Around 5 p.m. on Sunday, July 19th, 2020, the doorbell rang at Judge Salas's home in North Brunswick, New Jersey. She was there with her husband, Mark, and their son, Daniel. I mentioned earlier Daniel was at university in D.C., but he was home from college that weekend to celebrate his 20th birthday. It was reported that her son answered the door to what seemed to be a FedEx delivery man holding a package. Upon opening the door, the man immediately opened fire, shooting Daniel in the chest and shooting Mark several times. It is believed that Mark likely heard the commotion and then went to the door to see what was going on. The perpetrator then ran off, leaving a bleeding mark on the porch of their home and Daniel just in the foyer. Where was Judge Salas? So meanwhile, she was in the basement of the home. She says that she thought a bomb had gone off when she heard this gunfire. Of course, she rushed upstairs where she was met with the sight of her son holding his chest and her husband on the front porch bleeding and yelling for her to call 911. Oh, this is so terrible. Yeah, and... It's so sad because in interviews, she talks about how moments before the doorbell rang, she was in the basement with her son and they were just chatting. And, you know, he said, I love talking to you, mom. And then the doorbell goes off. He runs upstairs and within seconds, she hears the sound of bullets, which, again, she thought was, you know, an explosion. And she hears someone screaming no. Very, very heartbreakingly, she also is very vocal about the final moments of her son's life saying that she had lifted his shirt and saw the bullet hole and Mark had managed to crawl back inside and the two of them were together crying, watching him fade away. Oh, that's yeah. like a parent's worst nightmare. Yeah, it's really awful. Sadly, you know, Daniel died almost instantly and Mark was rushed to the hospital in critical condition. Who would commit such a heinous act? 
There were a lot of possible leads. Where do you think they look first? I mean, I would say her cases. Yeah, they look at all the cases that the judge has presided over and also her husband's client because he's a defense attorney. Oh, yeah, of course. He's, oh, my gosh. Yeah. They, they must have had a long list then of... They had a long list. And also, they didn't know much about Daniel. He's 20 years old. Who would want to harm him? But who knows? They didn't know was he involved in drugs? What was his deal? It's fascinating how quickly they were able to pull everything together with such a long list of potential suspects. Well, how long do you know? Are you going to tell me? Okay, I won't. I yes. won't ask. Okay. okay. During the investigation, they came across the name of Roy Den Hollander. He was a 72-year-old New Jersey native graduated from George Washington University Law School back in 1985, and he also earned an MBA from Columbia Business School in 1997. This is a smart guy. He worked as an attorney in the Office of Chief Counsel at the IRS, and then he was an associate in the late 80s with a very prestigious law firm in New York. In the 90s, he also worked in Russia as a PI. What? Yeah. He this has... is a suspect? Yeah. That's the suspect. Yeah. Oh, okay. And we'll get to how he came to be the suspect, but I just want to paint a picture of who this man is. When he worked in Russia, that's when he met a woman and got married in 2000. Marriage lasted for about a year. He accused his wife of being a prostitute and duping him into marriage to obtain a green card. It was contentious. She accused him of publishing her diary and naked photos online and threatening her with a gun. Also, let me mention, at the time they got married, she was 25 and he was 53. Mm. The reason I bring up his relationship is some people say that this is when he went off the handle. But who really knows for sure? The reason I bring this up is because he seems like someone who was working in society, working at the IRS, working as a lawyer. And well, he's accomplished. He's yeah. got commitments to, you know, he's got something like what we call the commitment or the stake in, yeah. you know, investment in society. So exactly. So I want to illustrate what he was doing and then where things may have taken a turn for him. He was self-described as an anti-feminist lawyer, also known as a men's right activist. Have you ever heard of this? I actually have recently. Um, I haven't heard someone actually identify as an anti-feminist lawyer. Yeah. That part I haven't heard. But What this means is most of his later dealings in the law had to do with protecting men's rights. For example, he tried to file lawsuits against bars and clubs that offered special deals on ladies' nights. Wait, I'm sorry. Like, that's discrimination? He's saying that's discrimination against men. Um, I thought no, you were going in a total different no, direction. Obviously, this failed. The courts did not side with him on that. He said it had violated the 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law. That's <laughs> it's <really> ridiculous, <laughs> okay? <laughs> it gets worse. And I'd be upset if there was no ladies' night. Right? So how many Jeez, deals How would I have get? gotten through my 20s? Exactly. Yeah. He also filed lawsuits against the federal government, which challenged the constitutionality of the Violence Against Women Act. <laughs> Are you kidding? So the Violence Against Women Act provided about $1.6 billion towards the investigation and prosecution of violent crimes against women. It also imposed automatic and mandatory restitution on those convicted. The act also established the Office of Violence Against Women within the Department of Justice. I mean, this is an act we applaud. But he this believed- is VAWA. I mean, this is like something. It also provided more assistance, shelters, like all resources yeah. for women who had been ignored. Yeah. So this is just giving you a little glimpse into his psyche here. Just one more case I want to highlight that he again unsuccessfully filed. This was against Columbia University, claiming that its women's studies program discriminated against men. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait, the, the 2000, wait, the 2008 lawsuit alleged that the program, quote, demonizes men and exalts women in order to justify discrimination against men based on collective guilt. I'm so sorry. this, I, again, this just okay. shows a okay. decline in what no. is going on here. This is unique. Yeah. I haven't heard yeah. anything like this before. Okay. I urge you to Google this as much as we don't like to give attention to people like him. But I urge you to go look at his website. It's Pretty nutty. He published many of his anti-feminist writings there. And you'll also see there was a bit of a foreshadow of the violence that was to come. Okay. Needless to say, he clearly had a deep-seated resentment towards women. He also had a history of blaming women for issues he had in life. Anecdotally, he would blame his mother, his ex-wife. It became clear that he not only hated women, he also just lashed out on anyone who he felt was a threat to him. In fact, he was also the suspect in another fatal shooting that had happened just a week before the incident at the judge's house. You're kidding. Nope. Oh, on, my God. On July 11th, 
52-year-old Mark Angelotti was found dead from a gunshot wound on the steps of his California home. He was a California-based men's rights lawyer and the president of the National Coalition for Men. But wouldn't that be someone that he would be aligned with? You would think. And I thought the same thing, Megan, is you would think since they both had this very unique field of being men's rights lawyers, you would think they would align. But some say Roy was actually angry because Mark was retained in a high-profile case that we'll get to in a minute. Okay. But before we get to that, can we just go back to this fact that Mark, he's now deceased, so I do not, you know, I don't want to talk ill of him because he was a victim here. But I do want to talk about that he was the president of the National Coalition for Men, which I did not know was a thing. I didn't know that was a thing either. Well, Megan, it is. Since 1977, the National Coalition for Men has been, quote, committed to ending harmful discrimination and stereotypes against boys, men, their families, and the women who love them. They claim to be a gender-inclusive, nonpartisan, ethnically diverse organization that affects civil rights reform through advocacy, education, outreach, and litigation. I've never heard of them before. And if they're gender-inclusive, does that mean they, even though they're men's rights, do they include women or there's like an equal emphasis? It sounds very strange because... The first line of their mission statement contradicts the second line of their mission statement. I think so. Okay. Yeah. So going back to the relationship between these two men, they were just rivals of one another. And they were involved in, at this time, they were both involved in separate federal lawsuits seeking to force the U.S. government to require all young women to join men in registering for a possible military draft. Oh, so they were advocating for a a draft, bring back a draft for both men and women. They're advocating that it's not fair that only men are drafted during time of war, that women should be drafted as well. But nobody's been drafted since, I mean, for 50 years or, you know, nobody, not that I know of since Vietnam. Yeah, they were just saying that the military's male-only draft was somehow... But to me, this goes kind of against their gender equality. No, no, it goes for it. They're they're saying that if if there's a draft, it should be imposed on both men and women. I'm not sure I disagree with that. I'm not sure that I see why they would, you know... I think we have bigger issues to to tackle, right? I guess maybe not why at this time or, you know, I'm not really sure I understand the context, but... I mean, that's aligned with there. They're saying the draft should be, you know, reflective of men and women. Mm -hmm. So it's unclear how how much these two knew each other, but they were part of the same circle. And Roy had made threatening statements against Mark on some online forums. Okay. After Mark was found dead, it was quickly discovered that Roy was in the area at that time. He had driven a rental car to the home, basically shot Mark, and then went straight to the train station and took a train out of the area. And in fact, he wasn't seen again until he was found after the murder of Daniel. So why would he lash out on Esther's family, going back to Judge Salas here? I mean, I'm just going to guess that he was in like he was in her courtroom on some case and received an adverse decision from her. Here we go, Megan. Roy had appeared in front of Judge Salas a few months earlier, but his case had been postponed, which perhaps led to his anger towards her. In this case, he represented the plaintiffs of a gender equality lawsuit was in the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey, challenging the constitutionality of the military's male-only draft. This is what we discussed a moment ago. Oh, okay. The lawsuit went before Judge Salas, who sided against some of Den Hollander's arguments, but allowed the case to proceed in court. Rory Den Hollander reportedly believed that Salas was deliberately stalling the lawsuit for political reasons. However, in actuality, the decision to postpone this case was not the judge's decision, but rather a decision of the government. Either way, she was most likely the target not only because of this case, but probably because she was a woman who was Hispanic and she was a trailblazer. But, okay, but she postponed it, but she was allowing it to go forward. Yep, you're right. But it seems as though he believed incorrectly that she was purposely stalling it for political reasons. Wow, okay. Just a day after... The ambush on Judge Salas's home, Roy Den Hollander's body was found. This is July 20th. He was found inside his rental car, dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. This was in upstate New York. Nearby investigators discovered a list of judges, doctors, and other targets. And of course, this list included Judge Salas and Mark Angelucci, as well as an oncologist who had been treating him. Apparently, he had recently received a terminal cancer diagnosis. And he wanted to kill his doctor? Because mm-hmm. oh. he believed he his didn't... doctor was not doing everything he could, perhaps. 
Okay. The pistol he used to kill himself was the same caliber as the weapon that was used in both the California shooting and the New Jersey shooting. Okay. Before we get to where we are today, because there's a little, uh, there's some things that have happened since. Why did this happen? How did this happen? I'm going to ask you what you think. I just want to give you a few more pieces of information and then I want to hear your theories. Okay. First thing I want to point out, Megan, is it seemed almost like it was a spree murder. If he had, obviously, a spree murder includes more than three. However, we know in a spree murder, there's not really a cooling off period. It almost seems like he went to California, shot someone, got right on that train and went straight to New Jersey and then shot the next victim. I would say I agree. Whole, I completely agree. The first question is, was he mentally ill? I mean, by the end of his life, this is a man who was alone, facing terminal cancer, very financially unstable, and was becoming more ostracized from the legal community and even those that are advocates for men's rights which within his own mini community, it seems like if you look at his writings and his postings, he was, I guess, part of this community of men's rights. And even within that community, he was now kind of on the outskirts. It really just appears to be like this classical story of someone who felt like, you know, the world did them wrong. And it led them almost to like a delusional psychotic break that led to the violence. What do you think? I have, I have a couple questions. Okay. First of all, I'm disappointed that he committed suicide. I'm always disappointed in the end. Like there, I don't feel like then there's like a measure of justice. Not that there's ever a justice. You know, when your child is gone, you can't bring them back. But that's disappointing that he wasn't ever brought in front of the criminal justice system. Is there, I have questions before I give you my mm-hmm. opinion, because this is complicated. But is there, could you, did we, do we know? Did he, was he ever diagnosed with any mental illness or personality disorders or anything that we know of? I don't, not that I was able to find. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Was that marriage that he had to that one woman the only marriage that he had? Yes. Did he have any children? No. Did he switch his career later on after the marriage to focus just on men's rights or was it like? It appears that that's when things started sliding out of control. Be- because he worked for the IRS too and he worked for A other... very prestigious law firm in New York. So... Okay. So it's almost the last, you know, 18 years of his life is when he really started focusing in on this, you know, small sect of individuals who are fighting for men's rights. Because he was so angered by whatever events transpired between him and his ex-wife. It seems like it, but they were only married a year. Without knowing, like, I'm I'm going to say this one's a little harder for me to judge without knowing it. Uh, I cannot imagine that he didn't have some type of, I I think you're right, maybe there was a break, but I can't imagine that he didn't have a history of either some specific mental illness or personality disorder, Um, you know, just something that he was already kind of predisposed. And he probably wasn't, who knows, maybe he wasn't medicated, right? Right. And it sounds like it was like an un... Uh, diagnosed. Right, right. And uh, he obviously didn't have good coping skills, I'm going to say. So he wasn't set up to handle these defeats. He seemed like he had a, you know, a break where he did became so focused on he he became he felt like he was the one being ostracized because he was a man and Mm -hmm. and 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 females. I mean, if I have to like, go deeper with, you know, criminological theory, it almost sounds like well, I know you're, you're going to say strain, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. We say strain for everything. And it does It does seem like there was a stressor in his I life have that another, triggered him. I think there's another one up there too. For me, I'm hearing it's, this is not my fault. Everyone else did this to me. I'm not to blame. It seems like he's blaming everyone else. So I hear techniques of neutralization. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. Okay, techniques of neutralization. We've discussed before, but this is like situational excuses where a person wants to commit a bad act, but preserve the image of them being the good person, mm-hmm. right? So I think in his mind, he's able to justify like these Denying bad, the victim, right? denying, denying the, injury. Denying, but, you know, everyone else. It's, again, denying responsibility in general and placing the blame on someone else so that your actions are justified. So mm-hmm. if I had to describe like why he was able to do this, you know, he probably did have some type of break yeah. and maybe he was psychotic. But in that psychotic state, he probably told himself, mm-hmm. she's the bad person. He's the bad person. Yeah. I'm the good person here. Mm-hmm. So I think I hear techniques of neutralization yeah. and probably strain doesn't have good coping skills. Possibly social bond, too, because although he although the community he belonged to is not necessarily a community that we would support, it would still provided a sense of community for him. And you're right. Social bond. So just so people know, I don't know if we've discussed it, but social bond theory is essentially when you have strong social bonds and attachments, you're less likely to mm-hmm. commit crime. When you break those bonds or when you don't have them, they don't exist at all. Um, you're kind of freer yeah. to commit crime. He didn't have a family. He, you know, he 
didn't have this community of colleagues anymore. He, you're right. Actually, if he didn't have, if he didn't have, it didn't even sound like he, this guy maybe had friends, no, no family. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, there's definitely either a lack of mm-hmm. lack of social bonds to begin with and then a broken social bond. And then going back to strain theory, when we talk about strain theory, there's the removal of positive stimuli, the introduction of negative stimuli and the, um, oh, the disconnect between what you want and what you get. If you look at his life, you could almost see all of these playing out. And like you mentioned, if you lack the proper coping mechanisms and you have all these sources of strain coming at you, then this is the result. So we geek out about this stuff, but we've talked about strain theory before. And this is like stressors in your life, you know, mm-hmm. like like not just, you know, I'm stressed out because I didn't get to mm-hmm. the post office today. But, you know, there are significant stressors and you mm-hmm. lose like the losing something you really, really want, you know, like losing a spouse or losing a job and or getting something you really don't want, which... And perhaps the diagnosis of a terminal cancer is maybe what put him over the edge. Who knows? That could absolutely be the case. I was almost, I was really surprised when you said he wanted to kill his oncologist. Yeah. But I'm sorry, you said there were other judges and lawyers on the list? Yeah. And these, I assume these were in cases he was like, you know, involved with. It in seemed front of like it. Mm-hmm. I, they okay. never release, as far as I know, they never release all the names, but... I wonder why then, in the end, now that we've covered like the theory part, I wonder why he killed himself before going to anyone else on that list. Because if there's a long list, it almost seems like he's an unfinished business. I, I could be wrong. Okay. But I think perhaps things didn't go as he as planned at the judge's house. Maybe he thought she'd be home alone, he'd kill her, and he, like I think he said, all right, they might be on to me. Maybe he watched the news and knew they were there was a manhunt. Okay, so that makes sense to me. Do you think it's also a possibility? I mean, probably not, but that he felt bad and panicked after he realized he killed a kid? Could be. Yeah. I mean, that wasn't the intended target. Maybe her family was, but he just shot a kid square in the chest and he didn't even get the judge. And so. But then again, who knows if he was after the judge? We hear this sometimes. If you really are angry at someone, you don't kill them, you kill the ones that they love. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, we're never going to have the answers to this. This Mm -hmm. is a real tragedy. Okay. Remember, this occurred just in July 2020, not that long ago. Right. But a lot has moved forward. That night when Judge Esther Salas, she lost her only child. She nearly lost her husband. And this could have been prevented. The attacker was able to easily identify a lot of her personal information. And this tragedy, of course, drew attention to the issues of safety for judges and their families, Mm -hmm. especially for judges who preside over serious cases, which can leave individuals angry and vengeful. Right. And with easy access to personal information, these tragedies happen more than they should. Right. And this isn't the first time a judge was targeted. There are several examples, just one that comes to mind. Back in 2005, Judge Joan Lefkow Her husband and mother were murdered in her home. The murder was perpetrated by a plaintiff from one of Judge Lefkow's previous cases. The plaintiff was angry after a ruling by the judge and was able to find out where she lived. He actually hid in their basement and there was a plan to assassinate the judge. Instead, he murdered her two family members when they found him hiding out in the basement. The fact that the attack on Judge Salas' family wasn't the first, it just shows that there's a major flaw in how judges' personal information is handled and overall the lack of protections that are put in place for them. I mean, I have to agree with that. I'm not surprised, though, that she's not the first judge. No. I know of judges and attorneys who've been targeted before by um, disgruntled you know, clients, defendants, other types of offenders. So I'm not surprised. Yeah. But you know, it does surprise me that a federal judge's information is so easily yeah. accessible. And this is quite startling. The U.S. Marshal Service reports that in 2019, there were almost 4,500 threats or inappropriate communications made against judges. And this is an increase of over 40% from 2016. Wow. And since 1979, there have been four federal judges who have been murdered. Since the murder, Judge Salas actively spoke out about the issue and really pushed for legislation to shield judges' personal information from the public specifically from individuals who may want to harm them. In New Jersey, recently, there was a new legislation that was introduced That was an attempt to protect judges, having the goal of making it not as easy, if not nearly impossible, for judges' personal information to be found and gathered. Now, we know that Judge Salas cannot lobby for legislation because she's a judge. Mm -hmm. However, she has spoken out about the tragedy that struck her and her family and the loss of her child. It's heartbreaking. You can see it. She's very public. And just recently, her efforts paid off. A couple months ago, on November 20th, 2020, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy signed legislation to keep identifying information of judges and law enforcement officials from the public. 
and it's aptly called Daniel's Law. The law also prohibits disclosure of home addresses of current or retired judges, as well as prosecutors, law enforcement officers, and their spouses and children. Oh, I'm really glad to hear that. Yes. It also creates a civil process for violation and makes it a crime for someone to publish an address or to share or repost it, including on social media. And this is going to be taken very seriously because if you publish an address, this could be a third or fourth degree crime. And of course, depending on whether the act was purposeful or reckless, this could be punishable by up to three to five years in prison and a fine of $15,000. That's appropriate. Absolutely. Currently, Esther is still presiding as a judge. Her husband, Mark, is still healing from his injuries. And I recently read that he's unfortunately had a bit of a medical setback and he's going to be needing surgery again in the near future. I urge you all to read the op-ed that was published in the New York Times. Uh, It was on December 8th, 2020. I read it really as a plea to Congress in which Judge Salas recounts the events of the shooting and she talks about the recent New Jersey legislation. She also highlights the Daniel Andrew Judicial Security and Privacy Act that is currently with the Senate and a similar bill that has brought to the House of Representatives. This takes Daniel's law even further. The bill would protect judges' personally identifiable information from resale by data brokers. So, you know, online. It, it, so this is, right. you know, really adding a, le- a whole layer of protection. Right. It would also allow federal judges to redact personal information displayed on federal government Internet sites and prevent the publication of personal information by other businesses or individuals. Lastly, it would encourage states to protect personal information improve the ability of the United States Marshal Service to identify threats, and I love this, and authorize upgrades to judges' home security systems. Oh, that's really good. Isn't that great? Well, I just, yeah, yeah so. fed- some federal judges actually do have security details, but not yes. all of them. But I think a la- uh, helping them make themselves more secure at home is really a good part of it. Yeah, that's the least we could do. And as Judge Salas sends, says it best, I want to end with a quote from this article. Quote, for our nation's sake, judicial security is essential. Federal judges must be free to make their decisions, no matter how unpopular, without the fear of harm. The federal government has a responsibility to protect all federal judges because our safety is foundational to our great democracy. Great case today, Amy. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. I'm glad to see something positive came from this unfortunate tragedy. Before we go, we have a couple questions from our supporters. So our first question is from Casey C. Megan Casey is currently getting her master's in sociology in California, and she is planning on getting her PhD and pursuing a career in academia. She says she has mostly been studying sex and sexuality, but her interest in crime has always lingered. She says she is not particularly interested in studying pedophilia or rape. She would like to know, do we have any recommendations or suggestions for areas of studies that can include sex, gender, and sexuality, as well as criminology? So the first thing that came to mind was studying victimology, which would be crimes against people that are, you know, um, crimes that are motivated by gender or sexuality biases, or even to go into policy or advocacy work or in that area. Do you have any other thoughts? So then uh, one of my suggestions would be to study crimes that involve gendered violence. Yes, that's a good idea. Yeah, that would be something that would be of interest because it's, you know, it's particularly targeting uh, what I think of as like the women of Juarez. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, they were, you know, murdered, uh, gendered by males because they were taking the male jobs. Um, So I would say there's a definite area. Or even hate crimes. Hate crimes, absolutely. I guess that goes into the victimology suggestion. It does. I like the victimology. I think the victimology one is definitely an appropriate one as well. Either way, Casey, you are awesome and good luck. And let us know if you have any other questions. Uh, We also have a question from Brianna Page. Brianna is also a PhD student. God, our listeners are smart. I love it. And she's getting her degree in criminology. And she says she knows a lot of PhD programs are tailored towards those who would like to go into academia. However, that's not her first choice. Her question is, what steps, if any, would you recommend for PhD students to take or start looking into For those of us who do not necessarily want a career in academia, but would like to do something such as policy work, research, or nonprofit. So I started my PhD program thinking that I was going to be going into policy work. So I never thought I was going into academia. I think the best advice for anyone is get as much experience as you can. Take, you know, get as many internships as you can. See, are you interested in doing direct care? You know, working with people in the system or leaving the system. Are you interested in advocacy, research, policy? Which part really interests you? And just talk to as many people as you can who are in those jobs and try to get a feel for what might interest you the most. I mean, I would definitely look at, you know, some of the lead organizations and see whether their in- their work interests you. So the Vera Institute, the Sentencing Project, the Marshall Project, 
You can see if you're the Innocence Project, if you're going to connect strongly with one of these causes. For me, I was always interested in academia. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you might even consider uh, law enforcement. To be honest, it's really helpful to have analyst researchers with a higher level of education. And it's really more desirable now, especially even, even in federal law enforcement, I would say. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you for that question. And best of luck in your PhD program. That is amazing. Our last question is from Siobhan. Remember, Siobhan, I love that name. Okay. Siobhan wants to know, what was it that got you both interested in crime and the justice system? And I, I want to add something. She says that she can pinpoint hers to two things. Her dad worked as a forensic chemist when she was young. Very cool. How cool is that? And she remembers him working on, their Peter, on the Peter Falconio case. That's a really interesting case. Yeah, yeah, I do. Wow, that is very cool. Yeah, that's super cool. I want to talk to your dad. That's a cool job. But <laughs> anyway, so Megan, what was it that got you interested in crime and the justice system? I've definitely said it once or twice before, but um, I'm always happy to say it again. It, as cheesy as it is, I watched crime shows with my mom when she was into them when I was a kid. And I should have been sleeping. My mom let me watch shows like LA Law, and I absolutely fell in love with criminal law. And that interest just never went away. It just changed because I realized that I didn't want to practice law, but I could not get away from my fascination with the field of criminal justice and the people in it. Thank you. And for me, it was just I was always interested in social justice, inequality. And obviously, you can't not be interested in the criminal justice system if you're interested in those areas. So for me, um, and then it was, of course, uh, cases of people who were wrongfully convicted that really drew me in. Thank you all so much for your questions. And we will catch you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer and editor is James Varga. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show while gaining access to ad-free episodes, exclusive AMAs, and other bonus content for a small monthly contribution for Patreon. For more information, visit patreon.com slash womenincrime. Sources for today's episode include Women's Health, The New York Times, The Washington Post, USA Today, NPR, NBC News, NJ Monthly, New Jersey Globe, CNN, Newsweek, and Good Morning America, and Good Morning America, and Good Morning America, and Good Morning.